Now, okay guys, welcome back. As you can see today, we do have a very special guest. This is Matty. He is on Twitter, DCL blogger that if many of you may know him already because he is the guru when it comes to NFTs. He's been around the block in the NFT space already for years and he's part of all of the different communities, knows all about different marketplaces. Also, if you go to his website, you see that he's been on radio. He is the mainstream mainstream um, adopter bringing in <laughs> mainstream adoption to nfts so let's do it <laughs> Matty, welcome <laughs> how are you doing good man good good ivan and everyone listening you know it's a pleasure to be here and i love spreading you know the and knowledge with nfts yeah, yeah i mean it's good to have you here and the crypto is so amazing because there are so many niches and uh, some niches are very very special like nft niche right now and it's blowing up and it's becoming big so it's very important that we do the show so you can actually explain to us what's going on but please first and foremost start with your own story how did you get into nfts and and how did you get so involved with them yeah, so I entered the crypto market in 2017, just like uh, every other moon boy, you know, you start seeing Bitcoin going up thousands of dollars, so you like, you're trying to figure out where to put your money. And so 2017, I wrote out, luckily I got in early, um, wrote out the, the bull run and I was like, um, you know, my portfolio went crazy. Then in Jan 2018, it started coming down. And then I was like, all right, well, maybe I need to find some cryptocurrencies to diversify into. So I looked into like second page um, cryptocurrencies again with the moon boy attitude. And I looked at, I found the Decentraland logo and I clicked there and I realized that people were buying and selling these digital lands and these digital assets. Back then I didn't even know what the hell an NFT was. All I knew was that there's these assets that you can now buy on blockchain that have variable values. And so people, people were buying them for hundreds of dollars. The next day people were coming and trying to buy them. Uh, sorry, people were selling them for hundreds of dollars. And then the next day people were coming in, new buyers that wanted to buy in. And so it was this hot marketplace with hundreds of people wanting to buy and sell these things. So I was like, you know, the back in the day at school, I used to buy and sell USBs. I used to buy and sell Pokemon cards. I used to do so much buying and selling. So I understand where the marketplace is hot. There's a lot of profit margin opportunity. That's what kind of got me into it. And then from there on, it expanded. And I realized that NFT is much of a broader thing. So looking at the bear market, how have NX, uh, NFTs performed during the past few years? Because I think you tweeted that they performed better than the cryptocurrency market as a whole. So can you expand a bit on that of NFT performance as a whole? Yeah, it has been really interesting because the best thing for the NFT market has been the, the crypto market kind of just stabilizing or going down. Because what happened was people were just like, this space is all about opportunity, right? The moment Bitcoin starts to break down, break up to 10, 12, 13K, everyone forgets about NFTs or everyone forgets about what's going on. Everyone forgets about the altcoins and they throw money at Bitcoin. And that's what we see. You know, when Bitcoin starts to make a move, some of these NFT projects, some people start to dump because they want to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon. But because for the last one or two years, it's been kind of stable or it's been a slow descent, people have kind of gone to NFT projects because when a sale happens of tens of thousands of dollars, it brings people in. It brings news. It brings all right, an Axie Infinity sold for $10,000. So other people jump in and start buying more Axies. A digital land sold for $100,000. So suddenly people, you know, it fires up this NFT market. So in, and this is one of the reasons I invested in the NFT space is because I know that we're going to start having million dollar NFT sales. And when that happens, it's going to bring the news. And when the news comes, they're going to diversify into, it's going to bring attention to this market, which is now going to be a very buzzing place with big sales. And so it's the same kind of mentality with cryptocurrency, where when Bitcoin starts to hit these parameters, people come running. The thing, same thing we're going to start seeing with the NFT space. Um, you know, some artists start to see tens, fifteen thousand dollars sales. So other collectors run up and try and pick their artists. You know, they try and pick their next art, and that drives up demand. So it's it actually it has actually performed very well. And those that know how to navigate and understand markets and buy and sell things and increase their portfolio have done very well. That's interesting. So you say that bear market actually brought more interest to NFTs because everything else was performing poorly, but NFTs <laughs> did perform okay, or did they appreciate, or did they just keep the value? How would you describe the end result over this next, you know, past few years? Not now that we have a hype, but before this recent hype, <laughs> how did NFTs perform in 2018, 19? Yeah, it's a very variable um, result because some NFTs just ran out of funding. They promised good products, but they didn't deliver. And so the hype kind of ran out. Some NFT products um, like Axie Infinity has a very good app. People love playing the game um, and they, they give you cryptocurrency for winning every game. So people in Philippines, they play it as a full-time job <laughs> and more people are playing the game. And now suddenly the very special rare Axies where there's only like 500 of them, they have a lot of value because they're like special collectibles. So, so certain ones that have done a very well tokenomic structure 
they've increased in value. Some NFT projects, they've just released more land and that devalues the land, right? So those that have done things right and have strong communities where people want to keep investing in, and they, like for Decentraland, I make sure there's a lot of conferences happening. I reach out to companies. I make sure there's HQs dropping and that kind of stuff brings value to the platform. And what brings value to the platform and the game and the user base brings value to the overall ecosystem. So it has been project to project. Uh, some projects have folded. Um, and for me right now, um, and I was talking to you, Ivan, before this, it's all about which projects have survived the bear market for the last two, three years, which ones still have funding and which ones have a user base that are still excited two years down the track. Because not just because things are coming up, but because right now there's a product that they all love. So it's one of those things. So when you see people buying all coins, they look at the coin market cap, maybe they look at some uh, Twitter influencers, YouTube influencers, they try to see what's interesting. And then when they find something that they like, they buy it and they buy basically the same thing as the other people that they follow, for example, or if they make their own research, basically everyone is buying the same thing because it's fungible. <laughs> With non-fungible, you might have a project like Decentraland, which is uh, very popular. You say it's uh, very interesting. Other people say it's interesting. You have CryptoKitties, the project is interesting. People say it's interesting. But when the person comes and wants to buy a piece of that, he also mm -hmm. needs to pick exactly what to buy. It's not that in exactly. like in all coins, everyone buys the same thing. They're all fungible. Here's everything's different. They're all non-fungible. So uh, how okay. would you how would you advise people to enter the different NFT projects? Let's say someone understands, okay, decentralized land sounds very interesting. Should I go to decentralized land? Should I go somewhere else? And how should they be part of community? What should they do practically to make good uh, decisions? Yeah, NFT projects are one of those things where you can't do that top level two minute research and just see a graph and be like, right, I'm in. But like you said, it's non-fungible. Every asset is different. You can't just make a decision and just be like, right, the graph looks good. The partnerships look good. Here's some money at the ERC20 token at this market price. The, the market price for each asset is different. The only way to secure and, and bring more kind of strength to your investment is to be part of that community and is to understand what's coming up, is to compare it against other projects, is to compare that special NFT that you're about to buy with other NFTs and ask questions. But I think at the moment, there's a big lack of data and UI and just that front end graphs that we're all used to that speak the language of the cryptocurrency group uh, crowd. And I know um, one really good website is Token Trove um, for Gods Unchained cards, where if you click on the card, it'll tell you every single sale in a graph that's happened. And so you can see if it's gone up, if it's gone down, if it's reached a stable point. And it kind of mimics the same thing like these um, cryptocurrency graphs happen. Like there's a kind of a floor or there's like a, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like a support level. There's like a peak level. So you can see when you're buying it, which point you're buying it at. But at the end of the day, I think you you will find it very difficult if you just buy the hype and you just buy these NFTs because everyone else is doing. There has to be some sort of deeper research and comparison to what you're buying. But I think in the future, in the next hopefully two, three months, I'm working on some top level websites, which is going to focus on UI and, and understanding the art market and sales and which sales have happened in, recently and comparing that to the recent sales and profit margins, blah, blah, blah. But those kind of things where you can just scan in one page, 10 different sales that have happened and figure out what's happening and where the opportunities might be. Those kind of websites should be coming out in the next like three to six months, I think. Interesting. So what we're seeing right now is this gr growing interest in NFTs. It feels like they have been fueled by the new marketplaces like Rarible. I feel that everyone now shares their Rarible links and they mint stuff mm -hmm. and people buy them. So why would you say that we have this hype right now? It's just during the past two weeks. Where did it come from <laughs> in your view? I think it came from two things. And I was looking very deeply into this. I think one, it came from a lot of products that are now mature is people are kind of finding out about and finding out about NFTs now because they have products that people can see. Decentraland, Rarible, um, you know, uh, Axie Infinity, they can visually see and engage and play with the projects. And they actually have a solution. If, you have an, if you're an artist, you can use the platform. It's not something that you can be like, oh, well, something's coming up in the next six months. You know, an ICO or something, you put your money in and wait. I think now that there's products that are usable, and that's the difference between the angle we're taking in the blockchain world now, previously it's all about what's coming up, what's going to disrupt. Now it's about what's out there, what is disrupting, and what's happening. So that coupled with DeFi and DeFi, everyone needs MetaMask and these, um, you know, to manage their own wallets to engage in these protocols. And suddenly everyone has these MetaMasks, so they all know and understand how to manage their own security and buy cryptocurrencies now, NFT tokens at the same time. $8 billion worth of, or $10 billion almost worth of, you know, money is stuck in DeFi protocols. So you can imagine how many users now 
have that MetaMask wallet, which previously the last six months they didn't. And then I think that's why the biggest issue for NFTs was to how the hell do we onboard people when we need to teach them how to use MetaMask and gas fees and all that crap. So I think the intersection of those two is what's creating the boom. That's very interesting. I really like that analysis of NFT, uh, sorry, uh, MetaMask wallet that allows for the NFT boom, because as you say, there, there have been so many opportunities in DeFi that many people simply because they wanted to be part of the hype in DeFi and get some alpha, mm -hmm. get some farming, they had to learn. So now they know it and they just enter a project like, for example, uh, Nifty Gateway or Known Origin, the ones that you showed me previously, exactly. and they can use them instantly. So that being said, let's talk a bit about these different marketplaces because people know Rarible, people know Super Rare. Which, which ones of these marketplaces do you use mostly and what is the difference between them? So for the last two years, Super Rare has been existing for, right? Um, people used to sell out there for two years um, and art used to sell for like 0 0.3 ETH, 0 0.5 ETH. And now it's kind of blown up because everyone art pieces. Super Rare is very unique in the sense that every art piece that you see is a one of one. Um, Rareable, you can mint a hundred versions of your art piece if you want to. So if it, someone, a new artist brings an art piece, he can say, hey, this has a thousand mints. And people don't, you know, it's all about collecting stuff. So people that collect one of ones, you have that only one unique art piece from that artist. And that's why people like Super Rare. So I think, um, you know, I collect based on the artist. So I follow the artist. And if he drops on Super, if he drops on Rarible, if, wherever he drops, I know the artist well. I know that he doesn't just mint like a thousand um, different art pieces every day. So I know the supply is managed well. I know that he makes good art. I know that he has a big bunch of big collectors that chase his work. I know that he's been, he has a good social following, that he spreads awareness every time he does a drop. Everyone kind of knows about it. And I know that, grow, that growth will always be there and amplify in the next two to three years. So for me, that's what I look like. Look for first the artist and the art. The art is really just a channel to look at the artist. The artist is what drives the investment kind of following me wanting to buy their, their art decision. So I'm looking at Super Rare and you showed me previously this guy uh, who has this, you know, minimalistic black gray art. Uh, what is his name? Pac. So mm -hmm. how did you right. find him? Did you do research? How do you really do this finding of artists? Well, I don't have any of his art pieces. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wish I did. I know Whale Shark, one of one of like the biggest NFT investors in art, and he kind of like um, put the fire on the art world himself. He was just buying art like crazy. Probably put like half a million dollars worth of money into art pieces. He was a very early collector in Pax work, and everyone used to wonder like, why in the world are we is you know are these even selling? Buying and it took me a long time to yeah buying gifts of what seems to be very simple art, <laughs> right? But you check out the Twitter and then you see 140,000 followers and you see that people love his simplistic vibe or, um, you know, he communicates a lot with a very simple, with minimal words, minimal art. And at the end of the day, there's big collectors that chase his work. There's a red, there's literally an, a red image that he made that sold for like 15 ETH. So, you know, it's all about the artist. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, we just saw this this cube selling for fourteen thousand dollars. This this thing right image? here, I think so. Wow. Yeah. So Mocha, oh, yeah. a museum of crypto arts, they have um, galleries in multiple metaverses, Somnium Space, etc. How much is this sold for? Twenty nine ETH. There you go. Ah, uh, interesting. So okay, so people also have galleries in virtual worlds displaying these yeah. things. Yep. <laughs> so I think the virtual world is bringing a lot of strength to the these things, a lot of utility. That suddenly you can display these, and if you have a popular casino, if you have a popular conference hall, and you have some art that you own on the wall from a popular artist, suddenly you're bringing value to the artist. You're bringing value to the um, land that you own as an NFT, etc. So there's a lot of like amplification mm, value growth happening. I understand. So if I have a parcel in the central land, I can put one of these things there, and now it's a famous artist that has mm -hmm. a painting there or someone put a painting of a famous artist. Exactly. So uh, it makes sense, but it's just, you know, it's just digital uh, digital things that I think makes mm -hmm. it so that people have, have problems understanding this. But in mm -hmm. real world, this is exactly how it world, works. And the world is becoming more and more digital. So to me, it makes sense that this will become big, but still, you know, you're buying a GIF and yeah. the, the only thing that it has is basically a link on the blockchain to the artist. So yeah. do you think that that is, enough for people to understand it or how should people be thinking about this really i kind of look at it as 
it's one of those things where you know people like to collect all sorts, all sorts, all sorts of things. They collect socks, they collect back scratches, they collect yeah. Coca Cola cans in the real world. And you can just argue and be like, man, you know, I can get you a back scratcher from the two dollar shop if you want to. But it's not like that. They collect them because they represent certain timelines in their historical life, which they collected this back scratcher that owns from this person that has this logo made from this artist. So it's all with art and collecting. It's all about the story, right? Um, and you know, at the end of the day, we can't dispute the traditional art market. It's in the hundreds of millions, billions, maybe trillions. People collect them. What are they? They're just canvas pieces with paint splashed onto them in some cases, but the artist is what counts. So I think, there is a great momentum here in the NFT world, and it's kind of proven that artists, one, artists like to create art and make them NFTs. Two, collectors will spend money to do that. And if you have that combination, and that combination is growing with revenue, then it's kind of like a strong bet that this will continue to grow. Yeah, and you also see so much money in NFTs today. And uh, if it keeps growing, then you cannot really argue against it because it is pop like you say with art. Yes. Maybe people don't understand modern art, but it doesn't matter. People still buy it for millions and millions. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing to realize that if you are okay. watching this and you think that this doesn't make sense, like people buying gifts, okay, ask yourself, do you understand modern art? Probably not. I don't understand. I, I told the one guys, I don't even think that Mona Lisa looks that nice, to be honest, like a picture, <laughs> but still it's, it's yeah. valued a lot. So it's not really about whether you or I understand it's about is there a market and are people willing exactly. to pay for it? Like, I, like with... the market for it. And I think, sorry, I'm going to cut you off. But one thing I, I thought about yesterday was the realization that there's two reasons why people collect NFTs. One is utility. The two is collectability. And a lot of the argument that's happening now is because no one can understand the collectability. But that exists based on the people that collect it. So the market for that specific collector piece of art or whatever it is, as long as that little niche keeps growing, that value that will continue to have value of course utility wise mm -hmm. you can scan a picture of an art piece and put it on your wall but these guys aren't buying them for utility there's other nfts like digital land that you're buying for utility that you or a, a, maybe a special sword but there's a mix of that or in some instance a separation that's creating this kind of confusion i think all right so let's say that i am interested in art and i want to see which kinds of paintings you have and let's say i know your address how do i mm -hmm. see it because there are many different marketplaces and I can go to a profile on Rarible. I can go maybe to a profile on, on this other uh, marketplace, but is, is there, is OpenSea the unified uh, way yeah. to go or? Yeah, OpenSea kind of has the API that drags some um, information from pretty much every NFT marketplace and people use the OpenSea API to build their own kind of data websites. So, so OpenSea is a really good one where you can just put my address in and you can see all the art that I collect across platforms anything on the ethereum chain that's an nft you'll see that existing in my portfolio interesting but what kind of uh, psychological effect do you think people have when they when they want to be part of this you mentioned collectability you mentioned utility but if we focus on collectability is it the respect from everyone else is it like kudos you know in in school you collect these cards and then your friends want your cards and they say wow you have this amazing card is is this what is the psychology driving it what what would you say is the human in instinct that is behind all of this psychologically so i think there's a mix and this is the interesting part because for the very first time you have artists musicians artists um, that draw things etc entering the blockchain space and so they're selling art, they're becoming wealthy, and they're buying even more art. They're not buying art because they want to sell it later on. They're buying it because they love the art, the art, the artist, etc. So you're seeing a mix of reasons. You're seeing artists that understand good art and artist work, and they're just buying because they love collecting, right? People like buy Charizards, you know, Pokemon card Charizards, because they just want to own like every Charizard they come across. They don't even have the mentality of selling it back on the marketplace. Then you're seeing a mix of investors that are looking for these indicators, similar to how in cryptocurrency, you, you see like, all right, so-and-so famous person is partnered up. So-and-so famous per mm, person right, right, right. owns this mana token. So it's a similar kind of mentality in some cases where you look at this art piece or this artist and you're like, all right, Whale Shark has some pieces, Moderats has some pieces, Steve has some pieces, some really big collectors are now following and fighting over these. So you know that one, they appreciate good art, two, they're big investors. Three, they're probably going to rally up even more investors. And, and in many cases, that's one of the research points that people are taking, along with social followings, etc. So it's kind of seeing that, right. that mix of psychology of the traditional crypto investor and now artists that give value just because they look good. So we mentioned the super rare. We, we talked about that. There's also known origin. So mm -hmm. this is similar to super rare, right? 
that they also vet the different uh, artists that they yeah. actually have original work so as far as i know i know super rare and makers place maybe known origin they kind of have an application process so that they can at least filter out you know who's going to be releasing porn or who's going to be releasing stuff that's not <laughs> ready for the platform yet right but rareable is an open platform you can jump in and do anything you want and, and upload whatever and you want also you mentioned this uh, nifty gateway so what, what yeah. is the special thing with them so Nifty Gateway, and this is the cool thing, right? There's like five or six platforms all kind of releasing NFT art now. So it's obviously becoming something big. Nifty Gateway, the parent company of this is the Winklevoss twins um, that are obviously billionaire, billionaire Bitcoin holders. And the special thing about this is every Thursday, they drop a set of art pieces from a famous artist and they sell them at ridiculously cheap prices, um, relatively cheap. So if you can check out, um, I don't know if you can put up uh, Trevor Jones again or if we should risk that. Yes, let, let's see it. Uh, but it should work. So, so these, yeah, these artists, they select and they hunt out for that how big followings that are already famous in the real world and they try and bring them to the NFT space. And here, the really interesting thing, um, sorry, Ivan, if you click, so you see those four at the top, if you scroll up. I see this one for 135k. <laughs> <laughs> Five up and you oh see, my God. Yeah, yeah. You see four different versions. So you can see there's that the one on the far right is only a one piece. Then he's made three versions of the gold, mm, then 10 versions wow. of the silver. So click on the bronze on the far left. Yeah. Yeah, click on that. And you can see there that original listing, $200. So it's a flat fee of $200 that you could have bought them for. And there's only 25. The most recent sell last mm, sold was $4,200. Wow. That's literally in two months. So, you know, Trevor Jones is a famous artist because this drop of his was one of the record breaking ones where he sold that Picasso's bull on the far right for $55,000. There's only one of one editions of that. Um, but people quickly picked up the other ones and they flipped it real quickly because now Trevor Jones is like a pretty popular artist. You know, he's doing collaborations with other big artists like Jose Del Boy, who's a comic artist. Jose Del Boy is a good one. He's, only, he's 87 years old and he used to do the comic art of he used to do the early comic art of 1960s of Marvel, like su uh, Superman, uh, Batman. So he has the rights. Yeah. He has the rights to create that sort of art. So he's making Superman art, etc., uh, and he's selling them for like 20, 30 Ethereum, right? So interesting. You know, there's this but so link that you want to create with the artist because he's historically he's like a you know a strong personality. So what is this five? Is it? It's not that it's sold for this. It's just that they want this price, right? Oh, uh, the last one sold. Okay, okay. The last one sold for this, and now they want yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. When it was dropped for in the first time, so during the drop time, it sold for two thousand five hundred dollars. Mm, I got think. it, got it, got it. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, insane. But if you get insane, man, it's uh, crazy because there's a huge collector base for this stuff. Ah, and now there is because interesting. Yeah, I mean, you, you cannot argue with these numbers. Uh, look, yes, people may not understand that people are paying for gifts like this, but then you look at. Uh, Okay, this number suggests that they're asking, but the closing numbers, actually what actually sold for, like 3.5K for, for this thing, an animation. But mm -hmm. once again, it's all about understanding that this is connected to this guy. This guy on the blockchain mm -hmm. gave you this painting. Mm -hmm. You paid for it. He gave exactly. it to you on the blockchain. That's the valuable thing. It's not that you have the That's animation. Right. Because animation you can download like it is. Super interesting. Because it really taps into this, this psychology that is applicable in the real world i have mona lisa i think maybe it doesn't look nice but still it's mona lisa so it's worth a lot and here is the same but in digital and just like mm. it took 10 years for people to understand bitcoin and still most people don't understand it but so many people today do understand that something intangible digital can have value and can really be worth hundreds and hundreds of billions and soon trillions now people they're wrapping their hands are, uh, heads around that yes you cannot touch it it's still valuable why because it's digital scarcity but now people have another mind block because it is i mean i do understand that many people who view this and they think that this is crazy it's bizarre to buy an uh, animation for 3.5k but mm -hmm. it is the same thing it's connected to the author in this case and that's digital scarcity in mm -hmm. uh, in this other type of way which is very exciting and you follow this artist how do you find new artists let's say you want to let's say you want to find new opportunities in this market uh, mm. how do you find it so i was only I'm, I'm like two weeks old in my art collection journey but i've been very lucky because i've picked some pieces that have done really well and ferocious is one of the artists that i've collected from and i remember looking at under one of ferocious's tweets and there was a um, comment from um pomp 
uh, Anthony Pom- Pompliadis, I think his name is. Yeah. And I was like, oh, holy crap, you know, he might be interested in, in these art pieces. So I suddenly messaged for this and I was like, hey, I'm going to buy out all your art pieces. What's available? What's the price? So I bought them in bulk. And two weeks later, Pomp came out with that article and uh, everyone's kind of collecting and, and I guess covered for this art on, um, you know, some YouTube channels, etc. So it's one of those things I look for some indicators and I actually like that art piece. I remember when Faroosh just made that piece and it and um, it came with a physical painting as well. So it was a physical painting and a digital animation of that. So it was an NFT and a physical. And I was like, I would love to buy that. So that, that's what originally attracted me. But then when doing my research, I saw those other points. I know that, um, you know, I see on um, his Twitter that he's very consistent on his updates on making art. He supports other artists. There's like 19,000 followers. Everyone loves Faroosh's art and um, you know, there's so much momentum going that you want to be part of the artist's journey. You want to have a piece that connects you to their progress. And 10 years down the track, um, if they become very, very popular, they're not going to give a crap about who owns a copy of that on the blockchain. They're going to care about who purchased that that came out of their wallet and that everyone recognizes as, you know, Maddie owns that that piece or Pomp owns that piece, etc. I, I like the long-term vision you're, you're seeing in this. So you, you think that some of these guys will become world-famous uh, artists. Some of them already are, as you say. Uh, well, some of them are... is 17 years old, but we're in the crypto industry, remember? People are crypto rich, right? If Bitcoin goes nuts, um, <laughs> yeah. when, when, if Bitcoin goes from $10,000 to $100,000, then people are going to spend money like crazy. So if there's assets on the blockchain, apart from just ERC-20s that they can diversify into, naturally, they're going to put their money in there. So I think... You know, buying art for me is a bet along with if I don't have Bitcoin, at least I have art. So if people become Bitcoin rich or crypto rich or Ethereum rich or whatever happens, I know that NFTs and assets and whichever stands out in this space, they will have there'll be some interest there because people become very spend friendly when they get crypto rich. Right. So for me, it's one of those hedges against not having too much Bitcoin, which I should have more of. Super interesting. What else is interesting? You you mentioned uh, on your Twitter, let me actually check it out. You have this uh, 25 industries. So the first one you say mm-hmm. is NFTs. Well, NFTs is basically everything. Then you say... Uh, uh, so art. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so art, art as an NFT, I think is going to be big. Um, then we have virtual land, which is, you know, it's it seems like it's going to be big. Um, but it has so much building to be done. People need to build a lot of stuff on each land. They need to build momentum. They need to build a user base, etc. But it amplifies and it connects these NFT projects because suddenly you can bring your NFTs to Decentraland and it'll interrupt. You, can, you know, you can make an avatar that runs across different metaverses that are blockchain enabled. So, so I think once interoper- interoperability comes online 21, 22, this is going to pick up. So in the real real world, the real estate is all about location and the the size and the and the state of the house of the building. Here, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't really matter. Like it's all digital. So w- mm-hmm. w- it's not that I need to commute to work for a long time, and that's why I live, you know, in a cheap house somewhere. I don't need to commute anywhere here. So what is mm-hmm. the what is the value here? Because you know, the, it, it's digital. So. Which yeah. land pieces have value and which don't? Mm-hmm. So I think scarcity plays a big, big role. And for the first one or two years, that's what we saw in Decentraland is <clears throat> whatever had scarcity. For example, if you have a land that's on the far outskirts, that's in the middle of nowhere, there's another like 60,000 lands like that. So that's like the cheapest land. But if you have a land that's connected to a road or a land that's connected to a special district, then that becomes more valuable because one, it's scarce. And two, you think that there's going to be more uh, foot traffic and visibility on the road, etc. But now in the last six months, what we're seeing is we're seeing development happen in Decentraland and pockets of development. So we had Binance HQ drop. Uh, we had four, like Matic. I think we're going to have MakerDAO as well drop. And that's all concentrated on this district called Crypto Valley. And that's managed by the Decentraland team. So I'm seeing a lot of VC firms that I'm talking to that want to get land right near there because they know it's going to be hot. So we're seeing development now in these worlds, whichever is kind of concentrating is providing the next kind of opportunity for value uh, is is pushing that land, the neighboring land, to grow in value. Um, but I think, but look, you know, in, and I, I I get the point that it's closer on the screen to to those uh, big big uh, HQs, as you say, or or roads mm. or districts. In the real world, it makes sense because then I have to travel. You know, if I want to go to Times Square and I live somewhere mm. far away, it takes a long time to travel. 
in digital world, it's all I can teleport, you know, from one district to another. It's this, this, this. Now, I get the point that because it's scarcity, like there are only a few land pieces that are around Binance mm -hmm. issue. I understand that scarcity. Is, is that it or... Uh, how do you view it? It's just that it's close. Yes, yes it is. Look, people love to own unique things at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah. They like to say, hey, man, I own the freaking best land in Decentral. And then they'll pay a lot of money for it because they have that money. There's obviously that mentality. But there's also because, you know, if you're next to some very hot areas that consistently bring traffic because they hold meetups consistently and you have a, a land right next to it, well, you can put an advertisement for your sign. And once the world has thousands and thousands of people and they're all concentrating in these areas, then, you know, your build would get visibility are more than something on the far outskirts. If it's on the right. far outskirts, nothing surrounded to it, right? It'll have no one going and checking it out. So that's the play or the bet on these lands that are near more concentrated builds. But if I have a land on the outskirts, I guess I could try to make it hot. I can invite some, maybe, maybe I can have Binance to move the HQ. Is that how people <laughs> do it? Like, you know, if you if you have a big a piece of real estate, in a city, you you may want to try to make the area better. May, maybe you invest in some, mm -hmm. you know, park park stuff um, and then what is called like yeah, like trees and stuff, nature, flowers. Mm -hmm. So do people exactly. do that, or or we're we're, we're not there yet? <laughs> we're, we're not there yet in the digital world. But for example, I have a very big estate right next to um, Crypto Valley. So I work with the Decentraland team. And I'm, every time I see a partnership opportunity, I bring them to Decentraland to build something on Crypto Valley because I know as that area gets stronger and bigger and more people want to build there, then my land will have more value. So it's kind of those things, you know, you, it's not one of those things where you can just invest and sit back for like years. You can do that, but you're going to devalue the platform because you just have a land that you, no one can build on, but you can be active and bring value to the platform. And as you and multiple people do that, then suddenly the whole platform and the whole ecosystem will develop. Got it. Got it. Got it. Let's move on to the next one. So here you say games as well. We've seen CryptoKitties. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's a game because it's more like collecting, but and co collecting and breathing? Maybe Axie Infinity is a game. How do you view this? So let's go on the. Um, we can open two things. We can open the Axie Infinity website if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and see. then we can also open their um, Twitter account. But they had some really big sales. They had a million dollars worth of sales in the last thirty days. So I can explain why that's happening. Yeah, I read that thing about. Uh, oh, one second. Uh, I remove this. Let's see. Here it is. Uh, so it's one of those things, Axie Infinity, you have three axes that battle against another three axes. And it's kind of like a card card play game where you get dealt random cards and each axis has six parts that randomly generated. You breed them, they, they sort of find, they have the same mechanics of Crypto Kitties, but instead of just breeding them, you can actually battle them. So one thing about uh, Axie Infinity is you play the game and man, I, I promise you in one week, you'll be addicted to it. <laughs> so for me, I downloaded the game, I played it and I couldn't get off the phone and I had to delete it to just get back to business life. And for me, that was a click in my, in my mind. I was like, wow, they've made a game that's one addictive and two investable because um, if you open up their Twitter account, I can show you some of their axes that sold for um, $30,000, yes. $50,000. Um, I think it's Axie. It's not an S. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So if you scroll down, uh, scroll down, scroll down. Yeah, I read about that uh, firm buying like one one hundred sixty k. Yeah, yeah. Which one? Sorry, scroll up. Up. Um. Yeah. Stop. It's down. Slowly down. Slowly down. There. Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, see that one with the six axes? Yeah. Open up that one. So you see, hopefully everyone can see this probably, properly, but you can see the mystic tag, the purple one. Yes, the um, purple stuff here, yeah. Yeah, so again, you have to know the story of this because back in the day when you could first buy Axie Infinity in the pre-sale, I think there was like 12, uh, maybe 5,000 or something that sold, but you had a chance of getting one of your parts being a mystic part. And then uh, you had a, even less of a chance of having two parts being a mystic uh, part and even less of a chance of having three parts being mystic. So now in the world, there's only like 15 mystic, part, uh, sorry, 15 axes that have two to three mystic parts to it. And there's only like three axes that have four pieces that are mystics. So this is an, at least one mystic part. And you can see that they've gone up from like 0 0.5 Ethereum. Now the cheapest one is 4.5 Ethereum. And these are the ones that utility wise, they're not that strong. But yes, they have mystic parts and those parts will evolve a bit better. But in terms of the strategy wise, they don't, people don't buy them because they're stronger. People buy them because they're very rare and they have that scarce amount. There's no more mystic parts that will ever be released. You can't breed them against each other. 
and people that have them buy them as like a trophy kind of axi. Right. And that's why um, Delphi Digital invested in them um, because they're going to be like the rarest ones, right? So if the game continues to develop thousands, millions of users, the only investable, really rare assets, they're going to be seen as like, you know, if you own a Mystic, then you're like the legend in the game. So it's kind of one of those things. Yeah, man, that's insane. 160K they bought. Uh, now, with CryptoKitties, I remember when that cat sold for 100K in 2017, even more than 100. There, there was a platform that they used that ensured that the sale was actually real. That is not was, you know, just done for marketing. That I have a friend and he buys from me and then I give him back the funds. So yeah. do you think that projects do it? Like, that, you know, they inflate the prices just to, to show off and say, wow, you know, this, this thing sold for 50K and this for 60K. This is really taking off. Because I think many people might suspect that, especially when they don't understand the digital scarcity part of these collectibles. And then they uh, get suspicious and they think that, hey, this is some kind of uh, thing they just want to hype it up so other people get in and uh, FOMO in. So do you think that happens a lot? Big time, big time. And I agree with that because... You know, if you kind of compare the NFT marketplaces or the NFT projects to the cryptocurrency order books, then you don't have people having thousands of buy and sell orders. You just have uh, maybe five or 10 axes or five or 10 lands where if you buy them, you bump the floor price from 8,000 to 10,000 mana. But it's actually very easy to just invest 100,000 mana, create some FOMO because everyone's like, oh, the floor price has increased. Like I've doubled my money on paper. But that's why you have to really know the project. And that's why I invest in, in high volume projects that transact a lot of volume. And I know the buyers, I know the sellers, and I can tell which ones are fakes because I know which one projects they, you know, which, who the popular collectors are and who's buying and who's selling. But sometimes you see so much volume happen, like Rarible for a long time, people were thinking, how can a marketplace just pump on the scene with 5,000 Ethereum weekly volume when all of these other established projects have only 400 max, you know, right. monthly volume. Oh, sorry, weekly volume. So it's one of those things where you have to look a little bit deeper and know the kind of gist of things. I'm not going to say Rarible is... Kind of whitewashing i know for a long time people thought they were or people were because they paid people in rari for trading activity so there's a lot of artists that just bought and sold their own stuff because they knew that they were getting gonna they were going to get reimbursed in rareable so you know it's one of those things that you have to have a little bit more knowledge and i i always advise on my twitter account and i hope people take that into consideration but is take your time with nft investing the space is going nowhere and you're going to lose more money if you just FOMO in than to actually just take that research time, you know, absorb it all in, listen to people, look at projects, understand the community, see why this asset is valuable before you put any money in. So that's interesting that you mentioned the Rarible and their token. What do you think about that approach to reward with um, fungible tokens that you have a platform token? Because they were, the, I mean, it's the, the, basically the only NFT token you can invest in that is fungible, that, that is big. Also, there's engine, there are a few others, but, you know, one of the new oh, ones. Man, matter. Uh, a mana, yeah, but you know, one of the low cap, new, new one, low cap, new one. People want yeah, low yeah. cap. Like, like you, you told yeah, me you, yeah. did, you did in 2018 that you, you scrolled all the way down <laughs> looking for the low cap. So do you think that's, right, a, that's right. a good idea to, to create this governance token? Do you think it, it has a future uh, for, for Rarible, but also just as a concept? Yeah, well, I think one of the issues that NFT projects had in the past growing out of their realm was creating these more liquid markets or having some sort of a fungible token that represents the broader project because to understand and buy you have to buy these nfts and that's too much of a knowledge barrier for some right people just like to throw money at a token so yeah i do think tokens will do well and rareable break broke out in the scene is because they just airdropped everyone like thousands of dollars basically and suddenly people had all this money to spend back on rareable and then again get rewarded for it but it attracted all the people all the artists all the collectors now just want to do business with rareable because they have they get reimbursed uh, a big part of you know, they get money kind of cash back with it. But I think now suddenly there's a big user base and a lot of people now follow Rarible. And now if the scene becomes very NFT related and we have another bull cycle and NFT projects can take center stage, then projects like Rarible, projects like, um, you know, whichever ones are up and coming that have a product. And that's the most important thing for me that have a product. I think they will do the best. But, you know, people like investing in low cap coins. So I wouldn't be surprised if some new NFT projects promise something and they get a lot of hype as well. So. But um, what's interesting is that you mentioned that uh, NFTs have been struggling with uh, liquidity and that is true because it's auction, it's not order books, so you need to wait for someone to buy your thing, so it's auction. Mm. But um, uh, you have, for example, engine NFTs and they are backed by engine. 
So mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Because to me, it means that maybe we could build something like Uniswap, like automated market maker, where you, you don't need to wait for it to sell. You know, if I just want to sell an NFT quickly, and it is an engine NFT, and it has engine backing it, mm -hmm. um, I could just sell it to a smart contract, because smart contract might say, okay, I can at least buy it for this amount that is in mm -hmm. engine. So what, 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 what do you think about engine NFTs? Have you used them a lot? I honestly haven't used Engine a lot. I know they make some really good games, but in terms of volume, I don't know how they're doing comparable to the Ethereum NFT space. Um, I like to. No, but but they I are. Like to, they, they are on Ethereum. They are on Ethereum, but it's just that they. Oh, use sorry. The, yeah, they the, are on Ethereum, but, but in terms of the engine specific marketplace. Yeah, yeah, but they like, use the you know they use the token in order to uh, back mm. the the NFTs. So I, I thought that yeah. was uh, quite interesting from them. I, I haven't looked at it, but it's a good point because suddenly you're right. You can have a marketplace that you can. It has a base value, so you can list something at a base price, or even put buy orders in because you know that you can buy these at a base price. I don't know, man. I haven't yeah. really thought about that much. I mean, what, one thing that would truly revolutionize this whole NFT space is, is if we had automated market maker. Like, for example, we have for ERC20s with Uniswap mm. that you can just sell to a smart contract and a smart contract will buy it from you because it has liquidity mm. providers and it, it can uh, ensure that it can give you a price based on the ratio of assets. For NFTs, mm. this is way more difficult because how do you know the value of one NFT? But yeah. maybe something like that could work. Yeah. There's um, some really interesting experiments. For example, there's a project called Niftex, which is an NFT exchange. And what you can do is you can put your NFT up and break it into ERC20 tokens. By break it into that, I mean what they do is they lock it up into another contract and they release ERC20 tokens to represent that. And they kind of sell it at a base price and suddenly there's a market that you can invest in this NFT by buying these ERC20s. So it unlocks that liquidity mm. issue that we have, but it's very NFT specific. So I don't know how once they have thousands of assets on there, it's gonna matter. But they've definitely got like some what very is rare- is it NFT DEX or how do you, what did you so, say? NIFDEX. N, N I F, yeah, T, T E X, e Niftex. Okay, interesting, Niftex.com. So yeah, I, I like that idea because then you can actually get some mm. volume. So what some people are doing is they're putting some really rare art. Um, they're putting some really rare crypto punks that have sold for like 150 ETH. Because as the owner, maybe you just want a share of that pie, right? right? Maybe you don't want to just hold on to that whole thing because you'll never get that liquidity back. And they also have a buyback clause. So someone can just, I think the buyer or the person that initially shards it or fractionalizes it, he can say, hey, I'll just buy it all out for X amount. If no one contests it, I think it buys it back at a price and it ah. unlocks that NFT again. Nice, nice, so nice. They're very smart people. I mean, another thing that I like is uh, just real estate. That we can, that NFTs will be used for uh, representing real estate, real real estate in the near future. Just like we have uh, Tether stable coins backed by real world assets, and there you have a company that guarantees those assets. But you know, it works. We have uh, stable coins. We have USDC, USDT. We have gold working like that as well, tokenized on the that, blockchain. Yeah. So I I look forward to a world where we can buy real estate across the world the world uh, through similar mechanisms and it's also going to be mm -hmm. NFTs. Another NFT idea that I think is brilliant is um, uh, also financial. It's bonds because each bond is unique as well with its um, uh, own interest rate with its own value. So that's also NFTs. I think there is yeah. a big uh, opportunity that is still unexplored and that is financial mm -hmm. NFTs because then it it may be easier for people to take that first step. Instead of yeah. understanding, you know, something like this with bulls <laughs> sending for 3K, mm -hmm. they can say, okay, it's a bond, you know, it's a bond, it's still NFT, but it's it's like a bond. So do, were you aware of what happened with, um, I think it's a yield insurer, one of the insurance NFTs kind of thing that came out with SAFE, SAFE token. Yeah, yeah, I, I, know, I know the concept that there, that there is like Nexus, but this particular with NFTs, I don't. But insurance also sounds yeah. like NFT because it's unique, it insu it's against a specific thing, yeah. For yeah. a specific thing. So what was happening was you could actually wrap your insurance in as an NFT, and then you could stake that NFT to get more um, safe yield, um, or whatever, however that worked. And then suddenly people were buying the crap out of um, insurance, and Nexus actually ran out of um, kind of the money that they were offering to insure. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was no more insurance available to to kind of you know get for people that were staking in liquidity because people were just buying them as NFTs and staking them. And I think there was like 5,000 Ethereum worth of NFTs that represented insurance on um, yield insurance, I think the name was, that sold within like a week or three days. So you're right, um, NFTs that represent you know policies and, and, and that kind of things will be big. 
So guys, I think the final thing here is the following. You know, when you heard about Bitcoin in 2012 and you thought that it doesn't make sense because you cannot touch it, this is the same thing. Many people just look at this, they cannot touch it, they think it's some kind of gift they, they pay 3000 for when they can just screenshot. But uh, that is exactly when you should get interested because the numbers speak for themselves. People are buying, people are selling, there is a market. And this market has been here even during the bear market. So global bear market in crypto. So it's not some kind of you know hype that is very short lived and that is just that now people are buying because it's hot. People have been buying this for years and years. So. To me, there's a clear psychological human underlying instinct here that values this. Even digital collectibles valuable. They are valuable. Now, Matty, thanks a lot for being here. Can you please give give our viewers some final actionable uh, points? So let's let's say someone they don't really get it yet. I think most people don't really get it. But <laughs> they look at this uh, <laughs> gifts. They're like, what the hell? But let's say someone yeah. is positive. They are convinced. They're convinced that this is that this is big. That they should be paying attention. What should they do? How should they get? into this i think um again not investment advice but i believe you know education is key you don't want to be just saying hey i want to buy some nfts and then suddenly you see something called nft coin and you throw your money at it right you want to like do your research so i think connecting yourself with influencers and education is key right now and i i do like daily two minute videos on my twitter and i put up i covered the last 24 hours in two minutes on twitter straight away so everyone can see what the hell is going on the big sales why it happened and i explain everything um, but education is one thing. Um, I think you should also go to OpenSea. Um, I don't know if you want to open that up, but OpenSea has this rankings chart and you can keep an eye on that. And what it does, I'll let Ivan open it up actually. Yeah, I'll open it. Yeah. Let's see. So click on rankings. There you go. Yeah. And you can see the volume, seven day volume, right? in Ethereum. So what I normally do is I keep an eye on this and I say, all right, which project just came up and why is it going up? So I'll dive deep into it. I'll join the Discord. I'll see the discussions. Um, and especially what I do, I'm a very conservative investor. I don't just put my money into something because it's hyped up. Because you join hype, you're going to get dumped on. That's just how it works in the NFT space. It's how it's worked in crypto. What I do is I wait for an established industry. So if, for example, Super Air existed for two years. But I noticed for the last six months, it was top trending for about six months straight. So for me, even though I didn't understand art, I had to realize and respect that they had consist consistent volume. So I dived deep into Super and you can see it's number seven, eight, a thousand Ethereum, which is very, very respectable. So these projects, um, the top ones, whichever jump straight to the top in terms of weekly volume, I keep an eye on and I'll join in as soon as they one starts showing volume or two, um, you know, they have consistent volume. So. But, but joining the community and asking questions and discussions is probably key because that gives you an idea as to what to invest in. You know, another important thing is that it is so small industry. I mean, look at this total volume. Now we're looking at total volume. Number one, yeah. decentralized, 64,000 ETH. It sounds like a lot. It's not really a lot, but uh, for mm -hmm. NFT, it's the biggest yeah. one. But then you just scroll to, let's say, number number 75. And here it's already below 100. Like number 70 is already just 100 ETH total mm -hmm. volume all time volume it's nothing <laughs> it's so small yeah. so so uh, one of the risks with um, new projects in nft space is you buy an nft and suddenly all the volume dries up and you can't sell that nft because no one gives it value again there's no liquidity so that's a really important thing with um, nfts as opposed to erc 20s at least you can put it on the exchange and someone will buy it even for like two dollars but in the nft space if you go into a new project and for one year they go quiet and no one's buying the nfts they have you know 0.1 ethereum volume per week and you you own 10 ethereum worth of <laughs> portfolio there's no way you can sell that mm. you know so you have to keep that into mind and that's you know a mentality that comes while following the market thanks a lot matt and thanks a lot everyone who was watched live not live but recorded but in you also leave comments leave comments for matt and uh, we'll also maybe do another follow-up because I, i'm sure people have uh, a lot of questions that being said matt thanks a lot and uh, it was fantastic fantastic times learning about uh, this fantastic industry Thanks, guys. I hope you have a lot of fun in the NFT industry. It kind of brings the kid in you, you know, collecting things around the world.